Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, um, the second and last one of this week. So we have a little bit that we have to figure out in the next two days, hopefully. Um, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> the dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have once again uh, to open your word and we ask for your spirit to speak to us, to correct us, to guide us. And we pray, Lord, that the things that we study will be beneficial, not just to us individually, but to those around us. And um, we pray for those following these studies, that your Holy Spirit can be with them as they contemplate these things. Help us to understand them and um be with us in this study, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So um, yesterday we had we had gone through and completed this line to our satisfaction, at least. Um, and this is Daniel 11, verse 23 and 24. Now there are we also have a present truth application to our line. Uh, or So that means our line is in this history. Now, when we looked at the verses themselves, so I'm going to go here in our Daniel 11 document. <clears throat> i just put these here in the text. Um, so we can see both of them at the same time. We had actually uh, placed the way marks, the arrival of the first message here, the formalization at 9-11, uh, the center of it as the empowerment. And um, then when we look at how we looked at these verses, well, we had made an application of 9-11 uh, to the Roman Jewish League. So these things are not lining up at this point. So that means what we put in the text, at least so far, in the present truth application, what we put here, and what we had placed in this diagram uh, don't line up. And these diagrams don't line up. Okay? So, so we have a problem. We have to decide what to do about that. Um, now here, there's a bunch of logic that makes this historical application very solid. And uh, uh, now we know this is, this line is not the main line of Rome. This is just verses 23 and 24, which is looking back at the history of uh, this league and its ultimate uh, result in connection with Rome. So we see this interaction between the Roman Empire and the Jews worked out in history. So if we're looking at this in our history, what is it that we're looking at? What is the, what is the primary interaction? If we're going to make a present truth application of verses 23 and 24, what is the primary interaction? So we have the Romans and the Jews in history leading up to you know, the Christians who in a sense are Jews. Um, and then we have our history. So we had 9-11 as this league in this text here, but we didn't do that in our diagram. So, so what is it that this, if we're talking about a league, a Roman Jewish league, this would be a league between um, the Seventh-day Adventist church and the papacy, right? That's how we would look at this. Or or would we look at it at, at the Jewish League as representing more of the United States? Which which do we look at it as? I would think that we would have to look at this as the Seventh-day Adventist Church going in league with the papacy. Right. So so that that was how we looked at it. Now, if we're going to look at this Roman Jewish League, now we have 9-11 that marks that. Now, what we could say 
is that we could interpret this line differently. That is, just because we have uh, this historical application um, that we believe to be correct, it doesn't mean that there is only one application that we could call a present truth application. That is, at different times, we might interpret this or apply this to a line that actually addresses, you know, 1989. That is, if we were looking at a league with the United States and the papacy, could we not have 1989 as part of that league? I mean, obviously, the league began before then, but we could say that there is a, a Roman Jewish league, so to speak, a papal United States, United States there representing uh, the Jews or the Jews representing the United States. Um, that could see a time at the end as 1989. And in a sense, we've already had that understanding. So, so we could have made that application. But what we have been doing is we've been making an application more particular to what's been happening within this movement. Even when the Seventh-day Adventist churches are involved in these lines, it's, it's more addressing the message that this movement has, either in response to what the church is doing, what they're accepting or rejecting, or particularly what's happening in the movement itself, what issues are involved with this movement. So we took this um, even for a time at the end of verse 24, and we had drawn then, whoops, I'm going to go the other way. <clears throat> we had drawn this line, right? So this line itself is um, based on taking that symbol of time, 6256, and what we, we noted is if we counted from December 25th, 2021, and we went back 6,256 inclusive days, it would bring us to November 9th, 2004. November 9th, 2004 is exactly center of the 30 years. Right. So we have that 30 year period from November 9th, 89 to November 9th, 2019. So 15 years, that means 6256 is 15 years. And, and then we, we attach that 6256 to 911. So we looked for another application of the word time and it brought us to from 911 to Jeff's summary. On October 28th, 2018. And, and that summary is, is fairly important because there's a truth about November 9th that is, is being examined here in that period from when, you know, October 3rd, when we first hear of that. And we have October 13th, where we have uh, uh, me affirming that for 391 and a half days. And then, you know, then we have the camp meeting. And, and then this is a week after the camp meeting, Jeff gives this summary. And so we put it there on this line from 9-11. And, and these two times, these two periods of 6,256 days, we then relate to the two periods of 360 years in the diagram below. So then we would have to say, well, how are we understanding the way marks that we placed in the diagram below in relation to what's above. And that is, is there stuff missing in this diagram above uh, that we need to add? So it could be that the diagram above is incomplete. So we had, had placed way marks there, but you know, we, we say here at the bottom, well, the empowerment um, we're marking from you know, 48 BC to 31 BC in between those two, the starts of those two periods of 360 years, you know, wouldn't we put the empowerment in this diagram in between those two periods, right? So, you know, so we have to figure out what is the rationale? How could we, how could we fit this together? Do they have to fit? Um, like does 1989 uh, have to be in Daniel 11, verse 23 and 24, where we started with 9-11. So there's, there's those types of problems. But it could be that the diagram above is incomplete. 
and that the 1989 period is marking a period of darkness from 1989 to September 11th, 2001. But then if we're starting it there, we're starting it, but that means we're saying 9-11 would parallel the Roman League. So, so there's uh, incongruity between the structures. And, and the question is, is that allowed? Do these structures have to be line up exactly perfectly with how we are interpreting the text in the present truth context? So that's the question. So let's take a look at uh, the diagram above. So I'm just going to bring it up in PowerPoint so I can edit it. So if we did the line this way, you can see that we actually have the first angel arriving at 1989 and 9-11 becomes the formalization. Where in the text itself, we, when we interpret it historically, we take this league and we're going to put the league as 9-11, right? Not as 1989. And so, and we have the league as the time of the end, the arrival of the first message. Now, if we were going to add things to this diagram, that is, if we were going to to change this diagram, and and I and I don't really have problems with this line, right? So, I mean, this line to me makes sense, but maybe you know when it comes to these two groups of waymarks, how we've we've placed them, maybe maybe there's another way to do this. So we have 1989 and we have 911. Now, I don't think we would put anything in between there. And then we have 11904 as the center of a structure, as an empowerment. And the reasoning behind that was simply what it is empowering is our understanding of these lines. And we had in, um, you know, interestingly, when it comes to this period of 30 years, we had uh, found in uh, when we were studying the book of Judges, that we could, that we had numerical representations of this period of 10,957 days. So I'll just find that quickly. Okay. And that was, uh, taking in, in the story of Jephthah, this, uh, 3,316 and adding it to, uh, the Shibboleth 7641. And, Amazingly, we got this number, uh, 10,957, which is the exact number of years from November 9th, 1989 to uh, November 9th, uh, 2019. Right. And, and here we have it representing basically a period of darkness. It's the 30 years from November 9th, 89 to November 9th, 2019. So, so that 30 years now we have the word time, right? So, so think about this. We have this story in the story of Jephthah. We have Jephthah's name and the shibboleth, which is part of that story, adding up to 30 years. And in Daniel chapter 11, we have extremely important a word, the word time, the times, that is exactly half of 30 years, right? So we have that 30 years in our history. It's a primary part of how we understand November 9th. So we have to say that that is important and that that center of that is important. That is, it represents uh, this chiastic structure. And this chiastic structure is all through scripture, all through the chronologies. It just shows up again and again, right? It shows up in Millerite history. It shows up in the story of Joseph. It shows up in Ezra. It shows up many places in Judges, um, and especially in our lines, it's part of our major structure. So we're saying it, it is like a key that unlocks something, uh, the chiasm is. And, and so that we have this 30 years represented here and the 15 years. So just, you know, simply you would just look at that number, uh, uh, 10,957, and if you did it as an inclusive count, it'd be 58. And, and how and that would be, um, so how did I do that? I think I have to, you know, it wasn't that simple, was it? Now, 
So it wasn't half. How how did we do that? How did we get the yeah, I'm simplif I'm oversimplified what 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 we did. Because yeah, half of that is five, four, seven, eight. Okay. Um yeah, so if I go back to this line again, you know, explain it again, it wasn't quite as simple as that. It gave us that from December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. So gave us the center. So let me see here. Yeah, so this gave us the center. And this is, yeah, four, 5,479. Okay. Um, so it's not quite as simple as that. But we have this 30 years that's there. And then from the end of our line, if we go back to the times, it gives us the center, not from the end of here. And then we have uh, these. And we never really looked at this. We never talked about it too much. But the Hebrew number 5479, and I was I was puzzling about it. So we probably should look at it briefly. It, it's, it's not a common word. And, and we could take 5478 as well, just because, you know, half of that 30 year period is 5478.5. Uh, but it's, it's this word in 5478 is interesting because it occurs once in the Bible and it occurs in Isaiah 52 or Isaiah 5, verse 25, and it says, Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn. It's the word torn. In the midst of the streets, and uh, so if their carcasses are torn in the midst of the streets. So one is we have 525. Five. So remember, 525 five represents... Um, the 520 years, or 520 years, 525 days from uh, July 18th to December 25th, 2021. So here I'll show you what I'm looking at. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So we have this, this word, uh, the midst of the streets. Now the midst, um, that means the center. Karen is the word. And the word streets actually means to sever properly to separate by a wall. So if we look at these, these, this Hebrew number, so what I'm going to do is go back here and I'm going to put this. So instead of the inclusive count, I'm just going to put this number. So I could put this as the Hebrew number, which means torn and it's related to Isaiah five verse 25. So Isaiah 25, verse 25, we understand that, that um, that's part of that, that symbols of that 777 structure over here. Right? 777 days, that's going to be from uh, July 18th, right? Um, and then it's going to be talked about torn in the midst, okay? So it's going to say they're, they're torn in the midst. Now, the midst is... Uh, 7130. So there's the verse. The carcasses were torn and, and they're going to have another word here as well. Um, that just torn, that means to become torn in the midst. 7130 is this word midst, which means the center. And 7130 is 19 years and 190 days. And so that's the word for midst. Any significance there? If we counted from 911, 7,130 days, it would bring us to March 20 in 2021. So, which is a Sabbath. It's uh, prophetic months. It's 237 prophetic months and 20 days. Any, any other thoughts? Okay. So anyway, we have this, this word, the symbol of the word itself. And then we have seven four or five four seven nine. Okay. So so we have the word midst, torn in the midst. And so that's attached to this word. So we can see that this 30 years is torn in the midst. Right? Does that make sense to people? Agreed. Okay. And then we have five four seven nine. Now this this word uh, again, it's very rare. It only occurs in two places. Uh, and it's a name. It's, uh, Sotai. Um, and it's in 
does. So it's just referring to uh, the children of Solomon's servants, the children of Sotai, the children of Sophra, the children of Peruda. So, so we just have this, this word Sotai. Now, it means changeful, according to Brown Drivers Briggs. Um, and it comes from a word suit, which means to become derelict or to turn aside. That would be mean idolatry, wrongful practice of idolatry. So, so the idea is that somebody's going to change or turn turn aside from something. Okay. And um, so uh, again, it's in uh, um, Ezra and then Nehemiah seven fifty seven. It's just the same, exactly the same verse or exactly the same. Wording, there's no difference. So it's just copied there in Nehemiah as in, as part of a list. So what would we make of that word? Um, so tie. So you have the five four seven eight and the five four seven nine. These two Hebrew numbers that are half of this thirty years. I'm just going to put this here. It's H five four seven nine. There we go. Uh, yeah. So tie, torn, changeful, and torn, I guess. I spell it right. So tay, I guess it'd be pronounced. So we've analyzed this a little bit more. And, and like we did in the other one, we looked at the the spans of time uh between them, right? And those spans of time uh, gave us the words oppression and and uh, stripped naked and destitute, right? So we can see that um, it's, it's a little bit different span of time, but but the idea that we could take this structure that's created, we could look at these spans and relate them to the Hebrew Hebrew words. When it comes to that eleven five five span, uh, that relates to the Hebrew word sour or sour grapes, uh, which we see. You know, in uh, in Ezekiel 18, verse 2, what mean ye, ye that use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. So we should be familiar with that. And it's also in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah 18, verse 5, for, for the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs and the fruit with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. Jeremiah 31 is going to also say, in those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. So it's kind of interesting uh, that Jeremiah and Ezekiel both refer to that prophecy, or proverb, I mean. Um, so we see that in Jeremiah 31, 29, Isaiah 18, verse 5, Jeremiah 31, 29, and 30, Isaiah 18, verse 5, and Ezekiel 18, verse 2. So so we have that for, so I'm just going to put an H there, sour grapes. And then we have um, another span here that we could address as well. Well, we have 5101. 4324, which we've looked at before, and 377. So just looking at these spans of time, I remember looking up 377. I don't remember what it said. Oh, that was interesting. Uh, 377 is the word ish, aleph, yod, uh, shin, uh, shin. And it's, um, it means to be a man. Show masculinity, but it doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible. I'm not sure why Strong's does this, but it's just a form of the word, which means to be a man. That's it's in the hith palal form, so it's reflexive. Um, um, so it is related to three seven six, which of course is the word ish, which means a man, right? Which occurs lots of times in the Bible. I mean, you're obviously going to have it in Genesis chapter 2 when he talks about Adam 
right? She was taken out of man. She's going to be called Isha, which is a woman, because she was taken out of man. Okay. So what would we make of that span of time here from Jeff's summary to November 9th, 2019? So I'm just going to put, we're going to put these, just these ages so that we can look at that Hebrew uh, number, uh, which is to be a man, which isn't in the Bible. What does that mean as a symbol? It's like when somebody mans up, right? Okay, I'll let you think about that one. And then we have 5101. And this is the word bre, nahak. And it's found only in Job. And doth the wild ass bre, when he hath eaten grass, right? Uh, among the bushes they braid, under the nettles they, they were gathered together. That's going to refer to, what is this? Who's doing this? Uh, they were driven forth from a man. Does it really give it? Maybe it's, I'm not sure who's braying here. Just basically, the Israelites are braying, I guess, like asses. Okay. So can we put any significance on these words? Gray here. Put this one in here. And then the 4324, I can't remember what that one was. And we're doing this because this might help us in the interpretation of, of the way marks. Oh, yeah, now I remember. So this word, um, 4324, is the, the name Michael, which is just the feminine form of Michael. So Michael, Saul's daughter. The word itself, uh, the meaning, it can refer to a brook that is um, properly a container that is a streamlet or brook. It means who is like God as well. So it's related to a number, <laughs> a word that means a brook. But the definition given is who is like God in Brown Driver Springs. But in Strong's, it just says it's a rivulet, same as, so it doesn't give the definition. And, and me call. Is how it be pronounced. But we're going to put here, who is like God. Well, there's our spans of time. Any thoughts about what this tells us about this line? So what about the sour grapes, for instance? It, it refers us to this proverb or parable, whatever you want to call it. The fathers have che- eaten the sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Does that have any relation to our lives? When the fathers ate the sour grapes, what are we typifying those sour grapes as being? Well, well, okay. So first, we know that the proverb is just saying that the sins of the fathers fall upon the children. Right. He said in Jeremiah that nowhere, no more will this proverb be heard in the land. Everybody's going to die for their own sins. So what it does is it connects generations. That, that's one thing we can say about it. Um, now, the illustration of what is a sour grape itself. What symbolically would be a sour grape? Yeah. Well, it would be a false doctrine of some sort, I would think. Thank you. Agreed. Yeah. As you had been presenting this and as, as you're going through this, I was intrigued by another question. Okay. When we were looking at Daniel 11.23, you had some points that we had we'd been addressing and we placed the numbers of of specific words within that verse okay which which verse daniel 11 23 okay right so in daniel so okay go on now this also occurs in daniel 11 6 along with several other locations within scripture yeah so we have lots of times we're using these Hebrew numbers and we're using them for spans of time. Like the end of years we used and I'm trying to remember which one specifically in verse 23. I think the, I'd have to look at, at all my notes. 6105, I know we have something to do with that. Anyway, go on. So when I'm looking at this, I found it, I, I was intrigued. Because Daniel 11.23, when when you had your notes up earlier, Mm -hmm. did we 
note the Hebrew number for the word league. Okay. Uh, I don't think we did. So when we go here, the 2266. Right. Uh, not that I remember. Um, now, the one thing we can say is it's um, 34 less than 2300. But The thing that was, was striking me with this, when when this – particular word 2266 is used mm -hmm. it's not being used by the same word that we had addressed when we were looking at Joshua chapter 9 okay so yeah so you're saying that when you talk about league in Joshua chapter 9 it's a different word correct yeah so this one 2266 is kabar it's so in Joshua chapter 9 uh, it has a different word for the league that they make. Correct. Okay. What's that word? Bereth or Bereth. Co yeah, covenant. Now, when we're looking at this, this joining together, mm -hmm. we have 25 verses that 2266 is used. I have 28. Oh, um, Maybe that's just because some verses use it twice, and that's why. So 25 verses. Yeah, I've got 25 verses and 29 matches. I have 28 matches and 26 verses. So interesting. Where are you getting? What are you using? I'm using eSword. So I look up the word two two six six, and it says King James 28 times. Okay, I'm not sure why we have a different number. Okay, but what intrigued me, first mention, of course, would be Genesis 14.3. Yeah. But then after that, as you go through the book of Exodus, mm -hmm. most everything has to do with how the curtains or other items are joined together. Yeah, it has to do with joining things together, like things that they're making and stuff, too. Things that structural, structurally coupled, and, and that's why it has lots of other, uh, like coupled, coupled, joined, um, but it also refers to compact, which would be agreement or fellowship, or in Daniel 11.23, read. Okay, go on. Now, with this, since we have this, this particular word used twice within, in the book of Daniel, and one being Daniel 11.6, we use the application from this, that in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then we come to this in, in 11.23, after the league made with him, shall he work deceitfully. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But it was the, the final application that the final the final verse that was striking me in this that's making me ask if this is something specific with the Adventist church because the final verse where this word is used is Hosea 417 okay which I don't have in my list oh no here it is it's joined it's translated as joined Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. When we're when we're making this application, this is why I'm I'm bending more toward the application as being from Daniel eleven twenty three with the Adventist Church rather than with the USA. Right, which is what we have already said. Right. Okay. So we're looking at this the Roman Jewish League. We looked at as 9-11, having to do with spiritual formation of the Protestants, which connects us indirectly as a league with, with the papacy, right? That's how we understood it. Right. Okay. Yeah, so that would be another good argument uh, for it. Now, now the number itself, 2266, is a period of six years, and um be about... 174 and a half days, either 74 or 75 days. Um, we did have periods of six years, um, but um, I'm just wondering if there's some place that we could 
place that in this line. So if we go from 9-11, which we have in this line, and we go to the end of 9-11, so we wait till the end of the day, and then we count 2266. You might want to switch your screen to show us what you're looking I, at. I, I, uh, let me see. Did I do this right or not? I might have done this wrong. Oh, I see what I did wrong. Never mind. So that's not going to work. So never mind. I'm just doing some math errors. Yeah, so I don't have – I'm just making some mathematical mistakes, trying to figure out where this 2266 might fit in with the lines. Yeah, so if we count from the end of September 11th, 2000 – no, not September 11th. What am I doing? The Mayan calendar. If we go to the Mayan calendar date um, and we count 2266, it brings us to March 7th, 2019. So it just brings us to that Sunday law symbol. That's all. So I done, done, did the math wrong. It got, for some reason, I was going for 9 11. Okay. So I don't know if that's significant at all. Okay. This might be significant. So if I count from 9 11 and I do this uh, doubling of 2266, so that's right. going to be. 4,532 days, and that's going to go to my birthday in 2014. So I don't know the significance of that. I know I'm blocking the screen there, but okay. So going back to this, Ephraim is joined with his idols. Let him alone. So what do we make of that then? I would have to say that the premise that I'm looking at is a progression because Ephraim as a symbol would have a religious and not secular connotation. And if this joining is being treated in this in this manner, it's not being treated as a so much as a religious covenant as Hebrew one two eight five would be. So I'm having to ask if this that we're seeing in Daniel eleven twenty three is also more of a secular type of joining, even if it is between groups that are purported as being religious in scope. Okay. Okay. Well, Ephraim usually refers to Northern Israel, and it refers not to the to uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, but to the United States. Okay. So that would be part of the problem with that. All right. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to your logic. So, okay. yeah. So, so that would be the one thing. Um, now it says next, you know, their drink is sour. They have committed hoarding continually. Um, now of course that's a different word. Um, but it's kind of interesting that it's there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that idea. So this has to do with false doctrine. Now, so so normally we 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 attach Ephraim to northern Israel, and northern Israel represents um, the United States itself, the Protestants, right? So not the Seventh Day Adventist Church. That would be um, Judah. Yeah. So just going back. So I just want to deal with this two two six six. So if I double it, it goes from nine eleven to my 52nd birthday, which is already part of the line, 777 days after the start of the 13th back tune of the Mayan calendar. So that, that symbol there that we have um, is also, you know, February 6th is also a symbol of, of 62 as well, which you have to always keep in mind. Yeah, and also Ephraim is uh, joined to, to idols. Let him alone. They drink set. Their drink is sour. They have committed hoarding continually, which is a doubling of the word zana, 2188 or 2181. So is this where we're, we're seeing this hoarding continually, 2181, 2181? Is this a rejection of the second angel's message? Well, it's a proclamation of the second angel's message. But can those that are joined to idols proclaim the second angel's message no but, but i'm just saying it's the second angel's message against them no those who are joined to idols can't proclaim it so this is 
um, you know, the doubling represents the, the midnight cry, right? Midnight and the midnight cry. Second angel's message. That's interesting. I mean, we're, we're sort of, you know, wandering off on these little, you know, bunny trails, um, trying to pull some of these things together. Either, as you're saying, this bunny trail is going yeah. to support the premise that we have been making or it is going to present an alternative that we need to consider. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to give us some details. So, uh, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to place this. Now, so Ephraim being joined to her idols, um, you know, if we deal with this whole thing of the sour grapes, right, and and then we're dealing as well with this league. So, so we have a league that's made in the past that affects the present, right? Right. Okay, so that, that's the idea of the sour grapes, why we're looking at the sour grapes. So when we're looking at this line, yeah, so many different things. So we're looking at this line. We have, we have a period of darkness here on this line. From 11.989, we have to the center of this chiasm, the midst which is this 30 years is torn in the midst. Um, as a symbol, we have 11904. And then we have 911 in there. So we have 11 9, 9, 11, 11, 9. And then we're going to have another 11 9, 2019. These are all part of a structure. And between 1989 and 2001, we have a period of time which is who is like God. And it's a feminine form of Michael, right? And it's so a feminine form would represent a church, a woman. And the question, then this first angel's message is re, is regarding this question, who is like God, right? The 144,000, you know, Christ character in his people. But it's under a period of time that's changeful. So we see this from 9-11 to the center of this, we see the sour grapes, so these are the doctrines of the Protestants. And this whole line is addressing a message that has come to the Adventist church that ultimately is going to be rejected. Right? I would agree. Now, now the league, uh, if we're going to have Ephraim, Ephraim represents the Protestants, not the Seventh-day Adventists. But the Seventh-day Adventists have made a league with the Protestants, right, at 9-11. All right. Okay, but they also they made a league with the Protestants. They've also made a league with Rome. Right, but but the the league with Rome through spiritual formation is an indirect league. The Protestants become the mediators, right? That is, Seventh Day Adventists just think they're trying to get along with Protestants, but Protestants have already become part of Babylon, right? They're accepting. This spiritual formation, which is such a bizarre thing for any Seventh-day Adventist to, you know, to make an idol, to bow down to it and worship it as part of um, education, right? Looking at all these different forms of worship and trying to find the value in them when they're condemned by the word of God, right? I mean, it's just bizarre that, you know, that we, we got into that situation. But we got into that situation because the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been courting the Protestants at least since the 1919 Bible Conference, right? I would I would have to say that they've been courting the Protestants since 1863. Yes, I know. So, but but I'm, I'm using the 1919 Bible Conference for a reason. Okay. Because of its symbolism of 11-9. All right. Okay. And, and that's really where, you know, Ellen White is dead. And now they have this conference and this conference is trying to weaken the value of inspiration, especially the spirit of the prophecy. It's the books of a new order, right? It's the beginning of the third generation, right? And then, um, it's going to be in the fourth generation in 1989 that the fourth generation begins. Um, and, and we have this, this heritage 
that then is is being challenged with the fall of the Soviet Union. At least it should be. That is, people should, in Adventism, they should be saying, what's happening prophetically? But the church isn't interested. And when 9-11 happens, the church is not interested. Right? We have these two major events that are recognized by the world. I mean, we know Trump recognized them, well, not just him, but NATO, in having you know, a part of the Berlin Wall there and a part of, you know, one of the, the girders or whatever from the, the Twin Towers as as monuments. And we see, you know, Trump in the center there making his speech, you know, pointing to both of these and mentioning them on either side of him. So, you know, the question is who is like God is definitely pertinent between those two events. But then we have the sour grapes. And and so that's going to lead us to the center of this chiasm. Now, then we have, um, you know, from 9-11, the time, 6256, to Jeff's summary. And we have a period of time, 5,101 days. Uh, that means to bray as an ass. Right? So this is going to be the message about Islam. Right? All right. Okay. So... And, and in Jeff's summary, he's addressing the 391 and a half, which ties together Ezekiel's prophecy dealing with uh, the kings of Judah, which represent, of course, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church and its leadership, and the prophecy of Revelation chapter 9. So we have the prophecy of Josiah and the prophecy of Josiah Lich tied together. And, and they're going to be connected to a prediction regarding uh, November 9th, 2019, right? Okay. And, and there we have a, a span of time which represents basically man up, be a man, right? Okay. So we have at the beginning who is like God, and then we have this, you know, be a man. And then we have this 777 days. Within that, we have some other symbols uh, that are connected to these these lines, just an analysis of it. So I think there must be more to this line than what we have here, but we need to we need some more way marks in here to actually understand what this line is. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what. And we had the second angel empowered as being, you know, the period. So so if we were going to be consistent with this other line, you know, as far as these periods of time, you know, we would move this over here and say that this is the empowerment here and this this here is the empowerment. And and we would need another date at the end. That's the arrival of the third angel. You know, we would need some other way marks in here that we don't have. So I don't know. At this point, I'm not really quite sure. We have, you know, the word even gives us the 622, right? Because we're just counting from the center of the tiles and even for a time. And we get that uh, 62220, so June 22nd, 2020, which we put up in the line above. And then we, we, we simply said, well, we need that 187 inclusive days from there to December 25th, 2020. So maybe there's some things about the way this line is structured that, you know, we, we have to reconsider that there's something missing here. But I don't know what or where and, and how. I don't know yet. There's definitely something we're missing in this. So if we go back to these verses. Um, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and become strong with a small people. Now, as far as understanding that historically, you know, this, this small people, we had a discussion regarding it. And, and so we... How did we decide? How did we decide the interpretation of the small people? Is because the general way we would look at this is uh, he's going to become numerous. That's the idea with the small people. People is just you know nation. That's goyim. So how, how did we understand that? We we didn't really. I don't think we came to a conclusion on. It. Like this idea was just that it's the Romans. They have um, small numbers and they grow but you know we, we didn't make an application really of this specifically 
who the small people are. I've been asking if the small people are representative of small groups. Um, well, the thing is, it's in singular. So it's just, it's just singular. So it's not plural. It's not goyim, it's goy. Mahat, a little or few. And then the bet at the front of mahat, right? It's bet, mem, ein, tet. That just means with. So with a small, with, with, um, with a small, so this is with small people, right? So not small, you know, small peoples. So it's referring to a specific nation. And the question is that nation the Jews? Is that nation Rome? Can we say that this small people is the Jews? Jews typified then by the Protestants? Um, well, I'm not making an application right now. Just say, can we say this small people represents the Jews historically? I'm struggling with that. Because, you know, it, it, it could be that he becomes strong, but he only has a few people, you know, that this is referring to Rome, right? And now, and Uriah Smith always has this problem. He doesn't seem to understand pronouns in Hebrew, and, and it's common. Just, um, you know, it says, Rome makes a league with the Jews. So this is Uriah Smith. I'll make this bigger. The him with whom the league is made must be the same power which has been the subject of the prophecy from the 14th verse. The Roman, uh, uh, the Roman Empire, that this is, has been tr- shown in the fulfillment of the prophecy in the three individuals who successively ruled over the empire, Julius Augustus and Tiberius Caesar. Now, now part of the problem is, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. Now, it doesn't tell us who's making a league with him. No. So, so we can say, well, the him, can refer to the power that's mentioned before Rome, which which I would agree, but you know it's not it's not obvious. And the he would be the same person, right? So it's going to be the league's going to be made with Rome, and Rome shall work deceitfully. For Rome, he shall come up, and Rome shall become strong with the small people. Now the question is, you know, who is the small pe- people? Are we looking at this small people in a literal application or a spiritual application? No, we're looking at it literal. We're just trying to understand historically what this prophecy is talking about. Okay. Because if we're going to make an application, we need to know what it is. So in other words, after the league made with the king of the north, he shall work deceitfully. The king of the north shall. I'm, I'm asking because I'm, I'm just looking at the context of everything we're looking at on this page right now. Right. So when it says after the league made with him, that's the king of the north. He, the king of the north, shall work deceitfully. For he, the king of the north, shall come up and shall be strong with the small people. That's how I'm interpreting the verse. Right. And we're in agreement on this. Okay. Yeah. So, so. So Rome is working deceitfully and, and he shall become with strong with a small people. Now, is that small people his people that he becomes strong with? That is, does he just become numerous? Cause that word strong is numerous. Doesn't refer to mili- military strength. It has to do with numbers. And so he's going to have a small people and he's going to become numerous with a small people. So I'm not sure what that is. Well, in this, as as you just brought up, we have issues with the way that Uriah Smith was approaching this. Mm -hmm. We have not been alone in having issues with the way that Smith approached multiple things. Yeah. I mean, James White had quite an issue with a lot of Uriah Smith's interpretations. Mm Mm-hmm. So at this time, we are entering into ground that had been covered by others in the past. Mm-hmm. But we're going to have to make a, a, a fair application to determine the error of Smith and how this is going to impact the way we're understanding this section. Yeah, I mean, 
yeah, and I'm not so much worried about Smith. I'm just saying that, you know, he's not, you know, he's just making assumptions regarding pronouns. And, he, and he's correct when he says him would refer to the to Rome in this case. But that's not necessarily true because he's using the English rules of pronouns, not the Hebrew rule, rule of pronouns. Right. So so when it when you have a him, it doesn't mean it's referring to a previous him. It could be a completely different him, right? So, so we can't make that assumption is all I'm saying. But we believe that this is the Roman Jewish league. Now, it could be that the league made with him, uh, could be referring to the him could be referring to the Jews, the Jews and the league itself. Um, the one who's making this league is making it with the Jews, right? Or it could be that the him refers to to Rome, right? So either one is possible. We just can't make make an assumption. But we know there's a Roman Jewish League, and and whoever enacts this league, I don't know if did the Jews go to the Romans and say we want to make a league, or did the Romans go to the Jews and say we want to make a league? I would I always assume it's the Jews that went to the Romans that they sought them out, but I, I don't know the answer to that question. Right. So, so we've always assumed this hymn is referring to Rome, but the hymn can refer to the Jews. Okay. As a question. Yeah. There was a book published prior to 2001 by Donald Mansell called okay. Adventist in Armageddon. Are you familiar with this? No, no, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, it's called Armageddon and the King of the of the North. Okay, well, I'm I'm looking at the original being Adventists and Armageddon. Okay. Published in 1999. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so there's a book published in 1999. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the author or the book. Okay, now as I understand it, this is a validation of James White's criticism of Uriah Smith's faulty biblical analysis. Yeah, which I deal with all the time on Facebook. Right. There's so right. many people pushing Uriah Smith's interpretation of the King of the North well, um, as, in relation as, to Daniel 11, verse 40. As we have conversed in the past, you know where I stand regarding Uriah Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Uriah Smith didn't create that idea, right? I mean, he's just repeating... Uh, ideas that other people had, right? So it's not like Uri Smith came up with this. No. Right. So, and, and that's what Uri Smith generally does is he, he uses commentaries and different people, Alexander Keith and, and so forth. Um, and sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong, right? So, but he has a dependence upon other people's opinions. But the problem here is the mixing of the literal and the spiritual, right? So we know, okay. we know that people are interpreting, you know, the river Euphrates, for instance, as literal in Revelation, which makes no sense because Babylon is spiritual. Why would we have a spiritual symbolic Babylon, but a li literal river Euphrates in the sixth plague that, you know, the drying up of the river Euphrates is a literal event connected with, with Babylon, that the river Euphrates dries up is something to do with end time events, which is, you know, a misapplication of prophecy. Okay, so we still have a lot of details here that we're going to have to address tomorrow. We're not going to move as fast as I'd like. So let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today and the problems that we face. Help us to resolve these um, in our personal study, in our understanding, and that we can correctly interpret the scriptures. Uh, we pray for those searching for truth, uh, that you can guide them, and we pray for your angels' care and protection for us and them and our loved ones today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>